Hello, hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at some special types of grain boundaries and introduce what's called the coincidence site lattice. We know grain boundaries are ubiquitous in polycrystalline materials, and understanding their structure is quite important in rationalizing how their presence can influence the properties of a material. So in the video, we'll talk about low angle grain boundaries, We'll talk about a coincidence site lattice and sigma grain boundaries. I hope you enjoy it. We know from our introductory video on structure of materials that microstructure is an extremely important part of our field. And when we think about the microstructure of a polycrystalline solid, of particular importance are grain boundaries. And that will be the purpose of this video, is to review some of the aspects of special grain boundaries. All polycrystalline materials contain grain boundaries, which are planar defects, and across those defects, the crystal orientation changes through a rotation. Why do grain boundaries form? Well, for example, during solidification from a liquid, so-called casting process, the individual solid grains in the liquid can nucleate simultaneously in different regions of the sample. And then, when they start to grow, they will do so with different crystallographic orientations. And then, at some point during that growth, they will impinge. And then, after complete solidification, we'll be left with a series of grain boundaries in the material. These grain boundaries are defects, two-dimensional defects. They cause a disruption in the periodicity. And by definition, atoms at the grain boundaries are in the wrong positions. So my grain boundary must be of higher energy. I have broken and distorted bonds. And my material is actually of a slightly lower density. Now to at least minimize this disruption, grain boundaries will try to lower their energy wherever possible by maximizing the registry of the lattice across that misoriented grain boundary. There are different types of grain boundaries, and they can be classified according to the type and the magnitude of the rotation of the respective grains. I show here four different categories, ranging from quite low angle grain boundaries, where low angle may mean less than, for example, five degrees rotation, higher angle grain boundaries, tilt boundaries, and twist boundaries. We're not going to worry about many of these. They can get extremely complicated, as there are many, many degrees of freedom in the rotation that can be quite difficult to represent. Instead, we'll stay with some of the lower angle grain boundaries, and we'll see how the atoms at the grain boundary at least try to retain some semblance of the overall crystallographic structure by forming types of defects that will minimize the disruption. An example is a low angle grain boundary, which can actually be described in many cases as an array of edge dislocations. And the crystal misorientation can be related to that dislocation spacing through the equation shown. So clearly at the dislocation at the grain boundary, shown here, I'll have a higher energy. But at least by forming, if you like, a familiar type of defect at the boundary, the rest of the structure at that interface can be maintained. Let's just take a quick look at a 3D model of the low angle symmetric grain boundary. The perfect structure on my left, simple cubic, no defects. And here on my right is a model of a grain boundary between a grain on the left and a grain on the right that are rotated by a small angle. And hopefully you can see here that the bridging between the two grains is achieved through the meeting of dislocations, in particular a periodic array of dislocations in each side of the grain boundary. Now, as we mentioned in the video on the PowerPoint, by measuring the separation of the dislocations and the length of the Burgers vector that accompanies the dislocation, we can figure out the angle of the grain boundary. So I'll measure this length here, which is equal to 
this one here. Drop my ruler. Uh, one and five eighths of an inch. And then I'll measure the length of the dislocations, separation. Here I've got two of them. Uh, we'll find that's just over 13 inches. And then we can from that calculate theta, which I'll show in the next slide in a minute. Just while we have this 3D model here, notice the open space. We said before that at grain boundaries, we know that things are not perfect, and so we tend to have a lot of open space where there are no atoms. Now this is a little bit exaggerated because of the open space, because I've shrunk the atoms down to these small green dots. But nevertheless, it shows you that we can have a certain degree of poros porosity within the grain boundary. And it's possible for, for dopants and impurities to start to segregate to those grain boundaries in those open spaces. How big are they? Let me just illustrate it. I'll take a rubber duck here. I can't get the rubber duck through the regular lattice. Squeaking, doesn't like it. But now I'll take the same size rubber duck and it does fit in the grain boundary. I'm not suggesting that ducks segregate to grain boundaries, but certainly ions like hydrogen can. And hydrogen segregation to, for example, iron grain boundaries can cause a lot of problem with the mechanical properties of the materials through brittlement. Let's follow up on the measurements we just made in our 3D model, just to check that this formula, simple trigonometry relating the Burgers vector and the dislocation separation works. So shown here is just a picture of our model. Uh, if we carefully measure the Burgers vector, we'll find it's 1.625 inches. Then the separation of the dislocations, actually twice the separation of the dislocation was 13 and a quarter inches. We see that yields a theta value of 14 degrees. Let's just double check that these two grains are rotated with respect to each other by that value. We'll add a protractor and here we can see, yep, seven degrees this way, seven degrees that way, 14 degrees. So it worked well. Well, there's quite a few examples of materials showing these types of low angle grain boundaries. For example, here is an experimental picture of a 10 degree grain boundary in strontium titanate. We can see the two grains with their perfect structures either side of the boundary down the middle. And at the boundary we see these darker regions which correspond to a periodic array of these dislocations. And indeed in this atomistic picture they've actually mapped out the Burgers vector of that dislocation. The main point here being that a lower angle boundary, as much registry on both sides of the boundary are maintained by forming these periodic dislocation cores to minimize the energetic disruption. But clearly the boundary energy is still higher than the bulk crystal, but at least again that disruption is minimized. Let's now turn to some special high angle tilt grain boundaries. And we'll look at these by looking at a picture of two tilted grains or rotated grains. So my green lattice and yellow lattice are rotated with respect to each other. Now this, for the higher angle rotations, can cause major disruptions in both lattices at that boundary. For example, on the right I just show any old angle, if you like, where the two lattices meet at the boundary and atoms are right on top of each other and there's considerable disruption and chaos, and therefore a very high energy. So we would expect, as the misorientation increases, the energy of the boundary should systematically increase. And for our example here, we will stay with a square or simple cubic lattice just to illustrate what can happen with these different rotations. So here I'm plotting the boundary energy as a function of the degree of rotation, in other words, the misorientation of the two grains on either side of a boundary. And for this simple square lattice, we'd expect the maximum misorientation to occur at 45 degrees, 
and therefore we'd expect the boundary energy to systematically increase as we approach that value. Well, here's some experimental data for boundaries in a system that has a square lattice or a simple cubic lattice. And the experimental data shows that at certain degrees of rotation, there appears to be some stabilization and lower energies at certain given rotation angles. And in fact, this is due to what's called formation of a coincidence site lattice. And so let's take a look at what those are and how we quantify them. Well, we'll illustrate this by just superimposing two grains and rotating one with respect to the other. And look at where some of the lattice sites start to coincide. So let's start rotating the red lattice and we'll see at some angles the sites in both grains will superimpose. I've stopped it at this angle of rotation and we can see these darker regions correspond to the overlap of the atoms in both grains. Let's just make that a little clearer by highlighting them in yellow. So this particular angle is 22.6 degrees. So what is occurring is that the lattice sites in both grains are coinciding thus the name the coincidence site lattice. And we'll see in a minute that these boundaries are more stable than just a random rotation. Let's keep rotating. Now, hopefully you can see there's a whole set of other coincidence sites. Again, let's highlight that lattice where those grains superimpose in yellow. So there's a higher fraction of sites overlapping, and this particular angle is 36.9 degrees. Let's keep rotating. We'll go a little quicker. There are some other overlaps. And then we get back to the completely oriented case where both grains, if you like, are completely overlapping. Let's take a closer look at some of those angles and how we describe quantitatively the coincidence site lattice. In particular, let's start with the theta equals 36.9 degree rotation. So here is my lattice formed by the coincidence of the lattice points in both grains, where some of the red and the blue grains superimpose. We're going to quantify the periodicity of that lattice or super lattice by looking at the area formed by the super lattice divided by the area of the fundamental unit cell. So there's my super lattice, and if we look carefully, we'll see that the length of the edges is a root 5 of that fundamental repeat. Let's just look closely here. We see that this length here is root 5, because we have in this direction 1 fundamental lattice here too, and from Pythagoras this must be root 5. So we have a root 5 by root 5 coincidence lattice or periodicity. And this is called the sigma value. So for this type of coincidence lattice, it's called a sigma 5 boundary. Now the most stable grain boundary actually lies along the direction with the highest density of coincidence sites. And I've shown it here through my black arrow. So now let's remove the additional atoms. Let's say that our red grain is to the left of the boundary and my blue grain is to the right. So I'll get rid of all of the red grain on the right side and I'll get rid of all of the blue grain on the left side and the boundary structure will become clearer. So I'm doing that here. Remove the atoms, let's remove those lattices and we'll see what we have at this 36.9 degree boundary Here's our one grain on the left, our other grain on the right, and now here is our grain boundary structure with a periodic superposition of certain lattice sites because of the sigma 5 CSL. And so again, I'm just clarifying the or orientation mismatch of the two grains through this angle theta. And we see that there's an ordered repeat of atoms at the grain boundary. It's still of higher energy. It's not a perfect lattice, but it's not a complete mismatch. At this particular angle, the two lattices are able to preserve at least some semblance of a periodic repeat, albeit 
with a larger periodicity. Well, we can do this on paper. Do these sorts of super lattices, these sigma boundaries exist in real systems? Yes, absolutely. Here's an experimentally resolved image of such a boundary. This was taken using high resolution transmission electron microscopy where we can actually image the atoms. And this particular sigma-5 boundary was imaged in a sample of MgO, magnesium oxide. And in fact, it's stabilized in many different material systems. The lower left is a picture of molybdenum metal, again with a sigma-5 boundary, and also strontium titanate, sigma-5 again. It's quite a common boundary, as it is far more stable than just a misorientation, grain boundary, if you like, of the two grains. Let's look at that other coincidence site lattice that occurred at 22.6 degrees. So here I'm showing the two grains rotated and the super lattice that forms from the coincidence of certain sites. Here is our periodicity. Now we just have to figure out what the area of this square is to figure out the sigma value. In this case, one edge of the square is root 13 of the fundamental repeat. 13 by 13, it's a sigma 13 boundary. Again, let's strip away the extra atoms on either side and just rotate it around. And what we see is the sigma 13 boundary between the yellow lattice on one side, the green lattice on the other. And here's our super lattice formed by the coincidence site. We get this periodic repeat along the boundary. Is it perfect? No. We can see here there are actually some atoms of yellow and green that are quite close to each other at the boundary. And that will cause higher energy. But at least in certain positions, they're forming a periodic coincidence. And so that picture I showed earlier of the actual grain boundary energies for a simple cubic system, we can see that these relatively lower energies are formed at these special values of theta. Here's my sigma 13. Here's my sigma 5. Sigma 5 showed an even greater stabilization than the sigma 13. And actually the value of sigma decreases as the coincidence increases. So for a perfect fit of all sites, i.e. no rotation, the sigma value would be 1. And as the value of sigma increases, less sites overlap and we wouldn't have as much stabilization. Well, there are many other coincidence site lattices formed in structures that have simple cubic symmetry, face-centered cubic symmetry, body-centered cubic symmetry, etc. And the angles at which they form depend intimately on the symmetry of the actual lattice concerned. For example, let's look at a face-centered cubic lattice. Now we'll rotate one grain with respect to the other. We get these moray patterns that form as various sites overlap. Here's our first one at 11 degrees in this case, where those sites highlighted in yellow correspond to an overlapping of the positions of the atoms in both grains. Here's another one. This is at 22.8 degrees. There's our coincidence sites. Here's another one, 27.7 degrees. There's our coincidence site lattice. And so we're seeing more of them in this case as the number of lattice points in our component cell increases. We can keep on going. Here is an angle of 38 degrees mutual rotation. There's my coincidence site lattice. We see many, many more coincidence sites in this case. So this looks as though it would be the most stable of all of the ones we've seen so far. Fifty-three point one degrees again, similar looking CSL. Sixty-seven point one degrees. Here's another one, and so we see for this and many other lattices, there are several special rotational angles where more stabilized structures are able to form at the grain boundary. There are always greater energy than the bulk, but by minimizing the disruption 
as we said earlier, they can at least decrease their excess energy at the boundary. And so I hope this has at least given you some insight as to how these particular stabilized boundaries can form.